Dr. Christopher Brown is a, a cardiologist, um, and um, we were chatting a minute ago. We have the same alma mater um, spread out by a, a few years uh, at OHSU in Portland. Uh, uh, Dr. Brown, I believe, did some residency training at Vanderbilt, and then uh, fellowship training in Southern California at Cedars Sinai and uh, and Scripps, I believe. Um, and uh, so with that, uh, maybe uh, you want to add to that introduction a little bit, Dr. Brown, but welcome to Port Angeles, uh, sort of in person and remotely. And thanks again for, for joining us. And I'll, uh, I'll mute myself out and video myself out during this presentation. Mark, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm Chris Brown. I am one of the complex. I run the complex PCI and vascular medicine program at Swedish. Uh, we focus our work out of Cherry Hill, as that's where most of our um, procedural labs are for uh, cardiology, and that's where we concentrate our care. But we take care of the entire uh, Swedish medical system and any uh, patients outside of it, uh, uh, which we can we can help. Uh, this talk is explicitly designed for. Um, internal medicine, family medicine, and uh, cardiologists. So I hope that uh, it's valuable. My thing, there we go. Now we're going forward. Um, these are my disclosures. I don't know that any of these are relevant to this actual talk, but that's what they are. So I think our learning objectives today are relatively straightforward. I would like to review peripheral arterial disease and its epidemiology with you. I think this helps us identify the right patients to screen. I'd like to review the diagnosis and then the treatments of PAD. We're going to review the current literature regarding some of the current therapies for PAD and critical limb ischemia. And then I have some case examples. We're not going to spend a lot of time um, arbitrating the surgical versus endovascular revascularization of patients um, because those in large part have been done extensively at, at other places um, and are essentially equivalent. So I think the most important set of couple of slides here are the first ones, which sort of shows you that the prevalence of peripheral vascular disease is actually quite high and it significantly goes up as, as patients age. And this is an older slide because it includes patients from 1978 up to 1998. And you can see that the prevalence is six or 7% uh, by the time patients are 70 or 80 years old. But in a much more contemporary look at this, uh, in the middle 2000s here, from 2000 to 2010, you can see that essentially that exact same trend holds true, although it's almost doubled. And this is in large part because of several risk factors for peripheral vascular disease um, that have increased that we'll get to in a minute. And you can see that it doesn't have any discrimination when it comes to men or women. Um, it's about 10 or 14 percent in men, and it's about nine or 12 percent in women so it, it's not a gender specific thing in, in really any meaningful way although uh there is a disparity in care uh when you look at the data more men are treated for peripheral vascular disease than women despite having almost equal incidence uh, the important things that contribute to this so your patients who are older as every decade of life passes those patients are in increasing risk of having peripheral vascular disease um, this male it does come out of data from 2000 to 2010 and it is a higher odds although it's not actually two any longer because of one of these other factors which you can see is a very strong factor which is diabetes so type 2 diabetes has sort of been the equalizer in the peripheral vascular space with regard to who actually gets uh, peripheral vascular disease you can see that overweight um, and hypertension and some of our sort of standard things that we think of as causing coronary artery disease are contributing um smoking is a, a big factor in peripheral vascular disease as much as it is in coronary disease and peripheral vascular disease it's it's very high it's a disproportionate number of patients um so that's a big thing so when you have patients who are aging patients who have diabetes and patients who smoke we really feel strongly that those patients um almost all deserve a baseline screening for peripheral vascular disease and i'll sort of get it exactly why i think that that's supported by the data um so pad is pretty prevalent when you look at some of the expected data for 2040, we believe that up to 16% of people over the age of 65 will have peripheral vascular disease. This is in large part driven uh, by the number of people who have type, type, type 2 diabetes by that age, um, which is you know kind of wild. But um, we think that in large part, our increases here from that 10 or 12% going up are mainly related to diabetes. Uh, and then 
fortunately or unfortunately for many of these patients, they also have a coexisting renal dysfunction because of their diabetes, um, which makes, of course, their care even more difficult. But it also makes their peripheral vascular disease more calcified and uh, more complicated. Uh, the same thing is true for critical limb ischemia, uh, the percentage being a little lower than peripheral vascular disease. And we're going to get into somewhat the definitions of what those two things are and how they differ, just to know that critical limb ischemia is sort of an end stage or a piece of peripheral vascular disease. So it's a smaller number of patients. Um, it's a smaller percentage of patients, but it is just as sick, if not sicker, level of patients. Um, right now, as of today, in the in the critical limb ischemia space, these really sick patients with peripheral vascular disease have pretty high rates of amputation. You can see in Rutherford class six, meaning people with like non-healing gangrenous wounds, up to a third of them get a amputation at four years and the mortality rate's extremely high. And I'll get to why that is. It is in large part due to their other cardiovascular risks in combination with the complications from having to have uh, amputations and other things. The other thing that's important to know about limb ischemia is how costly it is to the medical system. So if you look at uh, U.S. major amputation rates, there's about 80,000 of them a year, and it costs about $12 billion in direct costs. That's not indirect costs. That's $12 billion in direct costs and about $23 billion in total costs, including indirect costs a year to the medical system, which is a lot. And it's just you know, it's a it's only a piece of a bigger pie um, when it comes to the total medical budget for the United States, but it's a huge amount of money. Um, and you can also see that amputation costs a lot more than revascularization. So you can almost save 50% just by fixing somebody by either getting them a bypass or an endovascular intervention prior to them requiring amputation. So if we can catch these people at Rutherford class four or three. Um, where we can keep their amputation rates low, uh, we can help the, the entire medical system save money and provide that money for other important care uh, that patients need. So just a couple of definitions, so we're all working on the sort of same page. So claudication is a fatigue, discomfort, cramping pain um, in the lower extremities that's induced by exertion and it's relieved by rest. I think of claudication a lot like I think of stable angina. You have a blockage in an artery, and the more you try and use that tissue, the more discomfort you have. And when you stop using the tissue, you stop having discomfort. Limb ischemia is different. This is defined by being chronic, meaning not acute, greater than two weeks. Uh, ischemic pain that can occur at rest or with or presents itself in people who don't have discomfort as non-healing wounds, ulcers, or gangrene. Many patients have multiple comorbidities, as we mentioned, and many times the diabetes can prevent patients from being able to feel their calves or their feet any longer, and that can lead to them getting non-healing wounds or ulcers that are due to ischemia, um, but they don't know what they're from, or they don't even know that they're there. Um, you know, I'll give you an interesting anecdote from several weeks ago. A patient came who was needing a bypass surgery. Uh, somebody had noticed in their exam for some reason that the bottom of their leg looked a little ruddy. They sent them to us and they had a gangrenous toe. Uh, they had a, were a diabetic who had severe coronary disease, but also had horrible peripheral vascular disease that was undiagnosed. Um, and unfortunately, we were able to fix that foot. Um, and that person went on to get a bypass and is doing well. But um, it, it can be very hard because many of these patients will not show you that they have these problems um, and they might not even know, or they bumped their foot doing something six weeks ago and it still hasn't healed, but they don't think much of it because it doesn't hurt. Um, acute limb ischemia, we're not gonna talk a lot about, but that's essentially characterized by an acute loss of blood flow. The reason critical limb ischemia doesn't cause the same problems as acute limb ischemia is that people develop small, insufficient collaterals in their legs um, when this happens. So generally speaking, what I like to say is that the claudication for any given territory is because of a blockage, a territory above it. So if you have thigh pain, your blockage is in your iliacs. If you have calf pain, your blockage is in your thigh or in your SFA. And if you have foot discomfort or chronic uh, ischemic rest pain or non-healing wounds, your blockage is in your calf and it may also be above your calf that can be a compounding thing. Um, this is just a little reminder because not we don't spend a lot of time thinking about the um, arteries of the leg, I think, with regard to the anatomy. I'm going to try and turn on my laser pointer. Um, so you have the common iliac. It gives rise to the internal iliac, the external iliac. This comes out of the pelvis, over the pelvic brim, 
the delineation here, this inguinal ligament dele delineates the external iliac from the common femoral artery, but it's somewhat arbitrary. The common femoral artery turns into the femoral artery and the deep femoral artery. Some people also call this the profunda. It gives the blood flow to your thigh. The femoral artery continues along down your leg, and this is a back picture. It courses posteriorly through to what we call Hunter's Canal um, in the thigh to behind the knee, turns into the popliteal, and then that gives rise to the three vessels that lead to the foot. Um, and the three vessels that lead to the foot are the anterior tibial, the posterior tibial, and the perineal, but it's now been renamed the fibular, which is more appropriate because that's actually where it's located. Um, and those give rise to uh, an artery that stops at the level of the ankle with regard to the perineal. It gives rise to the dorsalis pedis from the anterior tibial, and it gives rise to the posterior tibial from the posterior tibial. Those then feed your foot. There's a plantar arch, much like there's an arch in your hand, a palmar arch, that helps have redundant circulation. So even if one of the major vessels to your lower extremity from below your knee goes out, you should still have sufficient flow to not have limb ischemia or other problems. All right, so the way that I think this is best done is by a couple of patient examples that hopefully delineate the data for how you should take care of these patients, but maybe will resonate as similar to somebody you see in everyday practice. So patient A will be a 62-year-old man, has type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. And then the question becomes, this is just an average patient, and what should you do or how do you screen for peripheral vascular disease uh, in this patient? And let me do one thing here. It's not going to do it. Okay. Thought maybe it was going to let me, but it won't. Anyway. Okay. So, how do you screen this patient, right? This is a person who has three of the, actually, three of the, and kind of four, 62, not quite 70, three of the four or four of four uh, risk factors from our earlier slide that describes how patients who are at risk for peripheral vascular disease. And so, when this person comes in, they're over, they're not over 65, but they are over 60. Uh, they're in the 50 to 64. So what are the class one recommendations here for the guidelines are that patients in that age group with any risk factors, this person has diabetes, has hyperlipidemia and has hypertension or a family of peripheral vascular disease should be screened. And I think what's important from this slide is, as you can see, as patients age, they need less things um, to require or to be a grade one recommendation to undergo screening. So we know that this person has risk factors present. We know that they fall into an age category where these risk factors would recommend we should screen them. But what does that even mean? And screening is relatively straightforward and it has excellent um, level of evidence to it. It's B, it's non-randomized because it's a screening, um, but it is a grade one recommendation. And so patients with increased risk of peripheral vascular disease should undergo comprehensive medical physical. That's fine. That's everything you guys are already doing. You're already talking to your patients, so that's not important. But the thing that is missing in many cases is us talking to our patients about whether or not they have leg symptoms. We talk to people about chest pain. We talk to them about shortness of breath, but often forgotten are their legs. Um, and until patients say, you know, my legs hurt when I walk, uh, it can be somewhat overlooked. And so it's important that in that history and physical for an annual visit that a patient is just simply asked, and maybe by the medical assistant, even in the screening questions, do you have leg pain? Do you have claudication? Meaning do you have pain when you walk is probably a better way to put that. Do you have any wounds on your feet that we can see? And then of course the feet should be examined. The Next thing is that patients who are at risk for peripheral vascular disease should undergo a vascular examination, which essentially just means that they need their feet palpated for pulses. It can be difficult to feel people's uh, pedal pulses, and we actually frequently use little Dopplers for it uh, because of our patient uh, population that we take care of. Um, but if you can't feel them, it might not be there, and you shouldn't think that you that you just can't find it. it it's very possible there's something else wrong. Um, and then the easiest way to go about this to figure out whether or not that's true is you can send a patient for an ABI or you can do an ABI in your office if you do ABIs. And, and that's pretty simple. You get a non-invasive blood pressure medicine in both arms uh, during the initial assessment, uh, and then you can move on to a, an, an ABI if you need to. So we asked this patient a lot of questions because they had risk factors. We asked specific questions for peripheral vascular disease. They suggested to us that they might have some claudication. Well, but now what are we going to do? What's the next best test? 
And I think that the first line test is pretty simple. It's to get an exercise brachial index or an exercise ABI. An exercise ABI is probably better because sometimes we can be uh, tricked by the resting ABIs, especially in clodicants who, who say that they only have discomfort when they really ambulate or go up a hill. And, you know, just a reminder for what an ankle brachial index is, you're essentially just taking the systolic ankle pressure that you can obtain. And we obtain this, generally speaking, using a Doppler ultrasound. Um, and it can be that anter we do the ABI on both the anterior tibial or the dorsalis pedis, as well as the posterior tibial, uh, and sometimes they're occluded, and so the ABI is, of course, zero um, or indeterminate. But we take the systolic ankle pressure, and we divide it by the highest systolic brachial pressure, and that gives us the ankle brachial index. Um, generally speaking, we're looking for a number around one, uh, anything less than uh, 0.9 is considered abnormal, and this 0.8 would be quite abnormal. And so here's a sort of a chart with regard to the recommended diagnostics. And this is a lot of information and not necessary, but the point is, is that we can get an ABI on pretty much anybody pretty easily. So if you screen a patient who you see in clinic because they have risk factors for vascular disease, and you think that they have something wrong with their legs or they, they may have something wrong with their legs, then an ABI is a really simple test for them to get. Um, and the normal is one. Abnormal is less than 0.9 and non-compressible is greater than 1.4. And in many patients in today's um, medical climate, their ABIs are going to be like 1.2 and because people are creeping towards these non-compressible arteries. And the reason is that as diabetes and kidney disease increases in prevalence, the calcification of the, the below the knee vessels has increased dramatically. And so the ABI normals, even though we say it's 1 to 1.4, most people are creeping towards non-compressible more and more. So it can be uh, a little bit disheartening because then we have to move on to some more other tests to solve our problems, but they're not difficult tests. You can, in an incompressible patient, you can get a toe brachial index, which is easily done at the same place that you get your ABI, generally speaking. Um, it requires a special little uh, sphygmomanometer for your toe. Um, all right, so this patient who we screened for uh, having risk factors had some symptoms, has an ABI, that's abnormal. We've now diagnosed PAD, but what are we gonna do with that? And the next step is just to be on guideline-directed medical therapy, and that's not particularly difficult. Um, and the guideline-directed medical therapy is not very different from what you would necessarily do for your patients who have coronary artery disease or just vascular disease in general. We would like them to take an aspirin. Uh, you can also give them a Plavix. There is uh, two trials that have shown that in subgroups of the trials that take Plavix uh, in peripheral vascular patients in particular, they do better. It primarily relates to the prevention of spontaneous myocardial infarctions uh, is the mechanism by which they do better, but they can be on either a baby aspirin or a uh, singular Plavix. Uh, either one is fine. Aspirin is probably easier for everybody to prescribe and not have to think about the, the, the side effects or dealing with the Plavix or the conversion of it. Um, statins are, of course, a 1A recommendation. We Controlling their blood pressure is critical to making that endothelium not have problems. Um, Smoking cessation is important. Um, it's one of the most important things. It's one of the hardest things for us to do um, because uh, smoking is very hard to stop and nicotine is very addictive, as you all know. Um, and it's a huge contributor to peripheral vascular disease as well as recurrence of peripheral vascular disease. So many of these patients will get treated, um, but some of their disease will come back two, three, five, seven years later and have to be retreated. Uh, and in large part, we find that many of them are people who continue to smoke. Uh, glycemic control has this weak recommendation, but is, is absolutely critical to this. This is from 2016, they have not updated these guidelines in a very long time with regard to that. And I think we're all very keenly aware that glycemic control is critical to helping these patients. Um, Solastazole can be used for symptomatic relief. It does increase walking distance. It's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Um, it has a contraindication in patients who have heart failure. It, that's mainly related to people with an, a reduced ejection fraction. Um, not the preserved form of heart failure. Uh, although we, I see people use Velocizol less and less, it's, it's very poorly tolerated in most patients and has very minimal uh, benefit in my personal experience and in the programs that I've trained in. Um, we like supervised exercise programs. And what does that look like? 
Well, that is really a prescribed regimen of gradually progressive exercise where we exercise patients until they have discomfort. They back down a little bit from where they're having discomfort and then they continue to exercise and then they ramp back up into discomfort. Um, and there's entire programs for that. And you can refer your patients to exercise programs or cardiac rehabs and they can do that or they can do it um, at home. The exercise programs are pretty well delineated on all the peripheral vascular society websites, uh, the Society for Vascular Surgery, the Society for Vascular Medicine, uh, things like that. They all have the uh, regimens for that. And I can provide you the PDFs if you want them. Um, and we can prescribe them to patients to do at home. I find that they do much better in a supervised fashion because it's just a lot easier to push yourself to discomfort and then uh, go back down and push yourself to discomfort when somebody is, is watching. And the final piece of the guideline directed medical therapy uh, is what about anticoagulation? And we tried warfarin, but that caused serious problems. And so that has a grade three. Warfarin causes harm. Now, if you need warfarin for atrial fibrillation or some other problem, that that's totally acceptable. But it is not for peripheral vascular disease used uh, to help or treat or do anything. But somebody wanted to ask that same question about uh, the NOACs. And so they perform the COMPASS trial, which is the clinical benefit for low-dose rivaroxaban plus aspirin versus aspirin alone. And essentially what you can see here is that the cumulative risk of cardiovascular death, stroke, myocardial infarction um, is improved when you add rivaroxaban to aspirin versus aspirin alone. So rivaroxaban alone or aspirin alone, not perfect, um, but when you add them together, there's a statistically significant difference than aspirin alone. Uh, and so this is a, a different dose of rivaroxaban than you use for AFib, um, but is an important finding for patients with peripheral vascular disease. So we, we put all of our patients with peripheral vascular disease on this combination therapy. And the, the main mechanism by which this works is that it reduces cardiovascular complications. They get, have less ischemic strokes, less myocardial infarctions, less acute limb ischemia, which is important. You can have critical limb ischemia that converts to acute limb ischemia. Uh, and they also have less death from cardiovascular causes and all that's statistically significant. And you can see those uh, reductions there, but generally speaking, they're on the order of magnitude of about 25% uh, or so. And this is just more uh, slides. You can see that the risk of fatal bleeding um, or symptomatic bleeding is essentially identical between the two. And this is because of the low dose of the rivaroxaban that's used. So it's just enough to do what we want and just enough to not cause significant bleeding issues. Um, and I'm not going to belabor this. This is a different paper for patients who have a subgroup of peripheral vascular disease that's essentially showing you the same cumulative outcome and risk. So, um, And then, of course, this is the a subgroup of patients who don't just have peripheral vascular disease, but are ones who get revascularized. Um, they're already on aspirin, all of them, regardless. And so rivaroxaban versus placebo. And you can again see uh, that there's a significant benefit here. The hazard ratio is about 15% here um, uh, reduction. So rivaroxaban, tiny dose, plus aspirin, decrease in composite of limb and cardiovascular events. There's an increased risk of bleeding and ISTH bleeding, which is, um, these are non-major bleeds. And then there's a no change in TIMI major bleeding, which is the most important of the, the major bleeding categories. All right, so we have our patient, we've screened them, we figured out they have an abnormal ABI. They have diagnosis of PAD, they have symptoms. So we give them medical therapy, we exercise them, we have success, we continue the therapy. Now, if they have symptoms despite the medical therapy, we have further work to do. And that further work, try and move this out of the way, um, is that we need probably more testing. And it's not invasive testing, uh, so that's good. It's just uh, a duplex ultrasound. So the level one recommendation for the next step is to perform some sort of imaging. So in patients who have medically refractory or continued problems after an abnormal ABI despite medical therapy, we're gonna go ahead and get them some sort of imaging of their lower extremities so we can understand their peripheral vascular disease and its contribution to their symptoms. And a duplex is probably the simplest and easiest thing for them to get. And as long as people are fasting, we can generally speaking image the iliac system all the way to the foot with pretty good accuracy. Uh, a CTA of course is probably a little bit better when you're talking about delineating the abdominal aorta and the iliac vasculature and does pretty well throughout the thighs as well. It does less good below the knees, um, but it involves contrast of course. And then an MRI is just a much harder to obtain imaging uh, modality, but can also be used and is, is quite good. 
Um, we have a level one recommendation for invasive angiography, but generally speaking, we reserve that for people who have critical limb ischemia with the understanding that their duplex is going to tell us something, meaning there's going to be something wrong, um, but they're always going to probably always end up in invasive angiography suite uh, to delineate that exactly and then consider revascularization for those patients. And so they, they, can, they can technically skip the duplex, but it's easy to just get everybody a duplex. That way, everybody's operating with good information. In particular, when patients have so much diabetes, like they do, some of their symptoms can be quite confusing. People have lower back pain that radiates down their leg because they have sciatica, but they also have claudication, but they also have neuropathy. They have many things going on at once. And so it can be nice to understand what the anatomy is that we're going to, to offer them either repair of or tell them that there's not, not needed to be done. All right, so this patient had testing that was notable for revascular, revascularizable disease. Most of it is most of the time when patients come to us and they're symptomatic and they've tried medical therapy and then they've got a duplex and the duplex shows something, uh, it almost always has something that we can fix. And so then the question becomes, how do you fix these things? And endovascular procedures for patients with claudication um, and any of the following is indicated and then surgical revascularization for any of the following. And essentially you can see that um, we fix aortoiliac disease as a 1A. We essentially fix almost all aortoiliac disease outside of, an and even with aneurysms, actually, uh, with endovascular work. Uh, we don't fix much of this with surgery anymore. Uh, FEMPOP disease, we fix with either surgery or uh, endovascular. They're essentially equivalent. And then infrapop disease, uh, we fix with either endovascular or sometimes in C2 vein grafts. Um, anything that is not done with a vein graft has pretty poor outcomes. Most of these synthetic grafts do quite bad, and that's why they have a grade three harm. So people trying to treat any claudicant with a graft that's prosthetic uh, should not be doing so. All right, and then um, just some trends in uh, where we're at. You can see that surgical volume over the last 10, and this extends out now, and it continues to kind of go down, has gone down before, in favor of endovascular procedures as primarily because patient risk factors have gone up with regard to their risk for surgery and outcomes for endovascular work has improved uh, significantly as we've continued to invent newer devices. Um, there was some controversy regarding uh, drug coded devices, which some of you may have heard in like the mainstream news media, um, but we were able to resolve all of that and essentially demonstrate that one paper uh, was equivalent of screwing fire in a crowded room and that in fact, people who get past letaxel treated devices live longer. All right, so just to shift gears for a minute, uh, we're going to talk about a different patient, but also a different patient population. So that first patient had regular peripheral vascular disease. They're a claudicant. Uh, that disease is almost always above the knee. This is a different epidemiology of patients. So critical limb ischemia being a subgroup of peripheral vascular disease. Again, it's characterized by ischemic pain that occurs at rest or tissue loss, meaning ulcers, gangrene, non-healing wounds, things along those lines. It's about 10% of all peripheral vascular disease, which makes it about 1% prevalent overall. Um, its natural history without revascularization is quite bad. It's about a six-month mortality, is about 25%, five-year mortality is 50%. Uh, the mainstay of therapy for people with critical limb ischemia is, for, is to be revascularized so you can heal non-healing wounds, not lose tissue, not get amputations, things along those lines. Um, it requires aggressive cardiovascular risk factor modification because these patients die from cardiovascular causes in addition to their amputation causes and their infections and other things. Um, and it's important because when we modify these risk factors for cardiovascular disease, we improve the patency of the peripheral vascular work that we're doing. And this is just a slide that demonstrates, I wish I could make this smaller. There we go. This is just a slide that demonstrates that the clinical presentation for uh, peripheral vascular disease, it's about 20 to 50 percent. It's about 25 percent asymptomatic people who have some disease, but they don't have symptoms. And those are your sort of atypical leg pain patients. It's about 35 or 40 percent claudicants. And then it's a small number, uh, about one to two percent, like I said, critical limb ischemia. But you can see how bad these people's outcomes are. Alive with both limbs at one year is 50 percent. That's pretty low. Amputation is a 25% at one year, and then cardiovascular mortality is up to 25% at a year. And we, the reason for that is primarily related to cardiovascular death. 
um, and cardiovascular causes. But you can see that even our clodicants, our five-year problems, the mortality is up to 30% at five years. And most of this is from cardiovascular causes. So these patients, they have vascular disease in one vascular bed. They have vascular disease in all vascular beds until proven otherwise. And just to put this on sort of perspective of what's going on, this is the incident number of cases. This is death within five years. You can see that essentially the only things that are more incident and deadly when you compare them incidents to death uh, percentage are pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer, and lung cancer. So this is not only an incredibly high incidence, right? The only things that are more incident than this is prostate, breast, colorectal, and lung cancer. And the only things that are more deadly than this are brain cancer, stomach cancer, esophageal cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, and lung cancer. So these are all things that we know are really bad. And we these are things that we know are pretty common. And this is something that we don't talk about a lot, but is actually quite common and really bad. So not a great thing to have. Really important that it be treated uh, as sort of as soon as possible once it's identified. So um, one of the big problems for limb ischemia is that amputation has in the past been frequently the first line of therapy for limb ischemia. It's up to a third of patients undergo a primary amputation. You saw that in the prior slide. But one of the big problems and one of the things that I'm trying to help uh, Swedish fight against, and uh, that's one of our big goals for the next couple of years, is that between 50 and 75 percent of patients never had an angiogram before they had an amputation, despite the fact that an angiogram reduces your need of amputation by 90%. So we could turn this number into 3% or 7% if we just took a picture of people's legs and then fixed whatever was wrong so we could save their limb. And so that's the sort of mantra behind limb, sa limb salvage is we want to prevent people from having amputation. And the reason is that given these massive number of amputations performed a year, which we talked about, that it, it contributes a huge amount of expense to the system. It also is a huge major cause of morbidity and mortality. Um, but if we're you know, in a sort of capitated system, uh, one of the big things we can do is we can not only help patients not lose their limb, we can help our the system uh, be more efficient by a huge amount, about 12 billion a year, which is about 80% of these claims are paid by Medicare and Medicaid, which means about 80% of these claims are paid by you, me, and everybody else who pay uh, taxes in the US. So, this is the most important slide in my opinion because all of those amputations all the ones that you saw on the slide before it is a top five procedure for mortality five to ten percent of bka patients die before discharge that's a, a incredible number any procedure that has a ten percent in hospital mortality is incredible 15 to 20 percent of above the knee amputations die before discharge a 20 percent in hospital mortality is on the order of somebody who presents with like septic shock uh, who is in, who has multi-organ failure. This is incredible. Um, perioperative mortality for FEMPOP is 2 to 8%, and it's 1 to 3% for endovascular recannulation. So we can take somebody who is going to get an above-the-knee amputation, hopefully give them an endovascular treatment, and take their mortality for in-hospital from 20% to 1%, which I think is a, a, a great advance in their care. And so with regard to limb ischemia, where do the guidelines stand? It's all class one stuff for limb ischemia because everybody realizes these patients are so far down the, the pathway of, of sickness. Early recognition is important because we would like to salvage their limbs. It's in incredibly important that they um, are assessed and that the risk of amputation is assessed. It's incredibly important that we have tight glycemic control and we control all their other modifiable risk factors. Um, revascularization is indicated whenever feasible. So this is any time we can do this, we will revascularize them in an attempt to save their limb. It's it's a salvage procedure. That's the whole point. But we really think we can provide patients um, um, with a, a great um, outcome here. And then, of course, this is not as strong because the level of evidence isn't as good, but we know that we can reduce the amount of people who get an amputation by 90%. So they do recommend that everybody get a below, uh, with below the knee lesions and limb ischemia get angiography with runoff to the foot to figure out whether they can be revascularized. And then this is uh, 
I don't know why this is a three. I'm not sure exactly that stem cell or gene therapy causes harm. It's just there is no data, at least to date, for this. Um, you will find some patients who leave the country to get stem cell therapy. Uh, we have not seen any necessarily bad outcomes from that, but it, it's really variable, and I don't know what people are actually getting, um, nor has any trial of either cardiac or peripheral vascular stem cell administration demonstrated any meaningful salvage of tissue. And that may in part be because the stem cells aren't getting where they need to go because the arteries aren't even open. All right, so here's patient B. Patient B is the same as patient A. They have all the same risk factors. They have the same pain in their leg, but this person has pain with rest, or maybe they have an exam with wounds. So they're different than our first patient in that they don't have claudication, but they have this other stuff, these other more extreme version of peripheral vascular disease. And the question is, well, what are we going to do to treat these people? And what are the options for limb ischemia? And we're going to give them the same medical therapy that we talked about before, all the same stuff. They got to stop smoking. You're probably not going to give them salazazole because they probably already have heart failure. Or they might probably have severe coronary disease, but you are going to give them all the rest of the stuff. You're going to treat their hypertension. You're going to give them a statin. You're going to give them aspirin. You might even give these people just aspirin and Plavix straight up. You're going to give them rivaroxaban if they need it. Uh, we're going to get them a supervised exercise program, but if they have rest pain, it's very unlikely that they're going to succeed in that exercise program. And more importantly, um, they're going to get a comprehensive evaluation, which includes a multidisciplinary team discussion. And, and what that means is, is, you know, you have a patient like this and you send them to us for our vascular medicine clinic. We're going to contact infectious disease and we're going to contact podiatrists and we're going to work together to figure out a plan for what kind of debridement can be done or needs to be done to salvage the foot, what kind of antibiotic therapy and the duration that's going to be needed as well as what is going to be our first line plan for revascularization to help this patient get these antibiotics to the wound and hopefully salvage as much tissue as possible and prevent amputations. And we talked a little bit about this already, but the level of evidence and the recommend guide, guideline recommendations for revascularizations and limb ischemia um, are all level one. Um, they should be performed by an interdisciplinary team before any amputation, which we already talked about. Um, and endovascular procedures are recommended to establish inline flow to the foot with non-healing wounds or gangrene. Uh, and that's in large part true um, because many of these people are very technically difficult to perform any sort of surgical intervention on. Some of them don't have in C2 veins, which you are required for limb ischemia to be revascularized surgically in a meaningful way. Um, but overall, the point is, is that the patients need to come see somebody who can help fix the arteries because the arteries got to have to deliver the blood flow in order to salvage the tissue, in order to deliver the antibiotics, in order to heal the minor amputations of a toe or a debridement that are going to occur that's going to save their limb and their life. And just a little bit more data for that. And when we look at all the cumulative trials of limb ischemia, and whether or not we think that revascularization is going to help them, it, it's pretty clear that there's a significant improvement in mortality um, <clears throat> when you revascularize patients. Uh, that is to say that it, there's at least a 20% improvement in mortality with revascularization when you look at all the below the knee trials for revascularization. And this holds true um, in a subset of other trials, um, similar outcomes, similar findings uh, with regard to limb loss. So essentially, when you save the limb, you save their life. That's kind of the easiest way to think about it. Um, and we save their limb more than we save their life because, again, they have many cardiovascular problems uh, that can complicate their medical course. But both are true uh, when we are able to revascularize these patients. And then, of course, we expect that when we fix somebody's limb that they're, or when we fix their artery that their wound is going to uh, improve dramatically, and that's the case here. You can see that they have significant improvement in their wound um, when they get revascularized. And there's a little bit of a methodology to how we revascularize people, so much as to say that we, generally speaking, will try and revascularize, if it's possible, the territory of the blood flow that uh, is being affected with regard to the wounds. That's not always possible, and many times we will try and revascularize the an artery that uh, leads to a collateral to that territory if needed, um, if that's the most technically feasible to start. But I generally speaking do try and get to the angiosomes if it's possible. The data for this is a little bit mixed with regard to whether it actually provides a significant benefit or whether if you can just get flow to the foot via any of the vessels um, that's in line, if it helps. I think both are true. Uh, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. I would like to get inline flow or flow from top to bottom, no collaterals, 
no funny branches, just where it's supposed to go. Um, if I can to wherever the wound that needs to be healed is, but we will settle for uh, a, a different type of revascularization uh, to a, the anterior tibial, maybe uh, even if it's in the heel of the patient, because that still can provide enough blood flow through the plantar arch or other communications uh, to heal a wound. And essentially the healing rate, at least early in the direct group is better than the indirect group. And that's one of the reasons we do try and target the angiosome. Um, and the limb salvage, at least, uh, is also thought to be better in the direct group when compared to the indirect group, at least in this one trial, although this is not a particularly large trial. There aren't a lot of trials that look at this. But when you look at survival, they kind of meet each other. And that's a multitude of factors. As we said, at five or six years, we're talking about many other cardiovascular factors that come into play. Um, but even early on, those curves don't separate a huge amount. They kind of separate after about a year. That probably has to do with the limb salvage. But generally speaking, we try and perform direct revascularization when we can. Uh, that's just a bit of a technical thing. All right, so patient B, they had medical therapy, which included antibiotics because they had non-healing wounds. They got a multidisciplinary team in, team discussion. We got to revascularize them. That's a first line indication for them. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of cases of patients, and then I'll take any questions you guys have, and hopefully, uh, hopefully that'll get you guys to your clinics. So this 82-year-old man has bad type 2 diabetes with neuropathy, has a bunch of risk factors, has horrible CKD, has lumbar stenosis. So he has complicated uh, lower extremity complaints with regard to how his discomfort feels. He has peripheral vascular disease, and ultimately uh, his his leg pain and his resting pain had been attributed to his diabetes and his lumbar pain for a long, long time until he developed a non-healing wound. Um, and then he subsequently got a bypass graft, uh, two bypass grafts um, to try and repair his non-healing wound. Uh, but he now has severe osteomyelitis and he was referred to me um, for consideration of alternative revascularization therapies. Um, despite aggressive wound care and antibiotics, he has not had any wound healing. Um, so he has ABIs that are non-compressible. He has TBIs that are horrendous. Um, uh, the right is essentially normal, but the left is just hor horrific. Uh, 0.26 is quite bad. Um, he has a Doppler ultrasound that shows, and these are just velocities, that shows that he has an occluded popliteal, occluded TP trunk, occluded posterior tibial. Um, he appears to have flow in his perineal or fibular artery, and he appears to have flow in his anterior tibial artery. We use these velocities um, as a ratio to each other to determine how bad a stenosis is. Uh, in this case, you don't need to have any velocity. When you have zero, you know that there's no flow, so that's, that's easy. And this is his wound on his uh, foot. And so we went ahead and took a picture here. This is the picture of the common femoral artery leading to the profunda. The SFA is occluded. It should run down the screen right here, but it's not. This is the profunda and some sort of branch. These are feeding the thigh. He has no flow. This is a reconstitution. The profunda is giving collaterals down here to a vessel just below his knee. You can't see his knee architecture because this is a digitally subtracted image where we, the camera system takes out all of the things that are present when we first step on the pedal and then we inject. And so it only highlights the dye uh, in order to get away from not being able to see the dye because of bony structures. And then here's the flow to his foot. Uh, you can see that he has what appears to be uh, anterior tibial and a perineal, but no clear posterior tibial. And then here is a picture of his foot, and this is his perineal coming in. You're going to see that it kind of collateralizes his posterior tibial a little bit here, um, and then we came, you can see the anterior tibial filling in as well. So we were able to cross this with some special wires and catheter systems. We took a picture to prove that we were where we thought we wanted to be. Um, we also can IVIS or do intravascular work. Uh, we did some balloon angioplasty here with some, some drug-coated balloons. And then this is the, the final angiogram. You can see how much more brisk the flow is now that it's directly in line. You can also see that, in fact, the anterior tibial is a CTO above. And what we saw originally was a collateral. So this perineal artery is giving rise to both the anterior tibial and the posterior tibial arteries, or the dorsalis pedis, if you want to call it that down here, um, and it's collateralizing both. So this is not inline flow in the sense that this is not direct to the angiosome, although this is very brisk for a collateral. This is a massive collateral. This is about as good as a, a regular vessel, and so this should, in theory, be enough to heal this. Now, if it doesn't in heal this patient's wound, we would come back and we would get access via this artery in the foot here, and we would reconstruct 
the posterior tibial. Now, the durability of that is not great in the sense that it will not last forever, but what our hope is that that posterior tibial reconstruction would last until the wound was healed and the patient was doing better, and then if that reoccludes, that's okay, and we'll monitor that over time, and if he has another non-healing wound, we can readdress it. The reason is that we have limited therapy for below-the-knee vessels with regard to uh, the patency. Uh, they're about open about 50% of the time at five years after we revascularize a below the knee CTO. Um, but we almost always get complete wound healing when we revascularize these. Um, and when they close down later, it's okay. It doesn't cause a significant problem unless they end up with another wound. In this case, he, you know, he has a huge amount of uh, anterior grade head pressure into this uh, um, perineal or fibular artery. So we're, you know, we think this is going to go well. And in fact, it does. And that's granulated tissue. Um, that's a completely healed wound. And, you know, he didn't lose his limb. He didn't lose his foot. He didn't get it below the ankle. He didn't get above the ankle. He didn't get it below the knee. He didn't get anything. His gangrene healed. Um, and he did quite well. Um, I'll go to our second case, and then hopefully we can get to some questions. 70-year-old uh, patient, lots of medical problems. Um, has an apical LV thrombus previously, has had a left floor extremity thromboembolism and was anticoagulated with Eliquis, uh, has a history of a DVT um, as well, uh, has many problems, uh, presents with a gangrenous toe. Um, the background is that he had a recent uh, episode of acute toe pain in the setting of discontinuation of his anticoagulation. Remember, he's had an LV thrombus and a pulmonary embolism. He probably has some sort of hypercoagulable state as well. He underwent a femoral perineal bypass with a bypass graft. Uh, and we talked about how you shouldn't be using PTFE or non-vein grafts in the first place, but he got a non-vein graft. He got an iliac thrombectomy um, and he got a left uh, angioplasty to the common iliac uh, after, his P after his thrombectomy. And he had Eliquis Im immediate started postoperatively. He presented to us about two months later with continued pain with no improvement in his toe, still looks terrible. Uh, and he has a duplex that suggests that he had a patent graft, but the flow to the foot is still quite bad, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. Why would the graft be open, but the flow to the foot is bad? Um, and so this is his toes. And this is a picture, and this is the graft. And you can see that there are valves in this structure here, and this is, in fact, the uh, femoral vein. So this graft was anastomosed to a vein below the knee. This is one of the reasons that below the knee surgery is complicated. The veins and arteries are quite small, and this was uh, misanastomosed to a vein instead of an artery. And so what he actually has is uh, steel from his foot. So not only did he have an embolic event, but he now has blood flow from his uh, thigh being stolen from his foot uh, to go directly back into his venous system via a large AV fistula that was created. And this is just a better picture of that vein. And while there are newer techniques where we actually use the vein below the knee in order to run an artery into the vein and then use the veins to perfuse the foot, um, which is a unique technique that I can talk about a little bit later if, if anybody wants to, um, that is not what this is. This is just uh, stealing the blood flow. And again, you can see this doesn't do what it's supposed to. Okay, so this is a completely occluded uh, system. There is no up and over option for him, so this isn't actually anterior grade work. So you can see I don't have a lot of my equipment that's in, but it is what it is. Um, we're able to gain access to his foot here. Uh, we're in the posterior tibial artery. We're taking a little micro picture so we can better understand our course and how we're going to get our wire up. Um, and fortunately, we were able uh, to get a, a wire to get into the correct place and then course the posterior tibial up the up the foot. We were able to do some work on this completely occluded uh, segment here. This is just, just working with a special polymer wire. This case was really more designed for peripheral operators. Uh, we're going to perform a technique called a reverse cart here up at the level of that uh, stump that was there you saw at the CFA. And then we're going to get back into our guiding catheter with our wire. We're going to wire in there and we're going to make a big rail system. And that's going to allow us to deliver our balloons, including our drug coated balloon. Uh, we're then going to come anterograde, meaning come back down the vessel, um, and then we're just going to use a little light balloon here in order to close the little tiny hole we made. This catheter is about two two millimeters or so in diameter. Or, uh, no, it's, a, it's about um, 1.3 millimeters in diameter, um, so we only need to make, uh, it only needs pressure for about three or four minutes, and then that, that little hole will be fine. And we'll just do a little ballooning there. And then this is just us taking a picture. We put in some stents here because we needed scaffolding in order to hold this artery open, which was severely diseased. 
and you can see we have excellent flow, but you can still see flow in that graft, of course, uh, into the venous system. And then here's some flow to the foot, which we think is dramatically improved, of course. That looks quite good to me. Um, you know, our hope being that this now inline flow will really help him a lot. Um, and then we went ahead and put a bunch of coils in this graft so it would go away because it was causing a massive AV fistula. And you can see the inline flow is much better now that we don't have that uh, goofy graft in place. And in fact, the inline flow is so powerful uh, that it backfills um, uh, the some of the perineal and other things. And so we, we, you know, our hope here is, of course, now he clearly has blood flow to his actual foot and to his toe, and hopefully that can heal. And this is his toe uh, several weeks later with uh, wound healing. And then this is just a couple of additional references in addition to the ones that you saw on the bottom of all the slides. Gosh, thanks a million for the great summary, uh, Dr. Brown, um, and um, and allowing a few time for a little bit of time for questions and stuff here. Um, maybe uh, maybe uh, the, those of you on ask a question could just unmute and uh, uh, or hold your hand up and. And we can uh, we can uh, see if we can get some questions answered. Figure out to stop sharing the screen. I will. Here we go. I have a question, Doctor Brown, and it's sort yes. of a. Uh, it's not nearly as sort of technical as as your last comments here uh last uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so but so what about the uh the bane of a primary care doctor's existence which is the uh, uh truck comes to town with the screening vascular ultrasounds in the basement of the local church yeah well i mean i think that that's uh I don't know if it has to be the bane of your existence. I think it can be the bane of my existence or it can be that my happiness is actually, in fact, what I would call it, which is, you know, you have somewhere for those patients to be seen. We don't have to see these patients in person. We have lots of ways to see them virtually. They don't have to drive all the way to Swedish. Um, once we figure out exactly what's going on and understand their symptoms as well as what's happened in their, you know, the screening truck then we can apply all the medical therapy as well as any of the peripheral vascular uh, interventions that they need. Uh, of course, we do those down here, but everything else we can take care of in a somewhat remote fashion, which can, I think, help the patients with regard to the travel and some of the geographic logistics. Um, but I don't think it needs to be a, a, a huge thing in the sense that, you know, we're here to help you. That's really the- mentioned that there was a, in some of the uh, outcomes that many of those patients who did poorly had never had an angiogram. Um, by that, do you mean um, a traditional uh, angiogram, or 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 what about the role of a of a uh, aortofem runoff uh, CTA? Um, yeah. Um, so. In the limb ischemia patients, it's a much harder thing to get uh, with accurate data. And in a contemporary environment, there's so much calcium and blooming artifact that a lot of those runoff CTAs, they really can only give you data of the, for the iliac vasculature. Sometimes they can get the femorals, um, but generally speaking, I think the duplex with regard to its ability to at least see stenosis is severe, superior, but it doesn't really tell you the whole story. Uh, that data is, is talking about a direct angiogram so but it, what it really is talking about is, as a surrogate is revascularization because the direct angiogram it, it being used as a mechanism by which we perform or plan a revascularization so essentially if you're going to get an amputation nobody's ever taken a picture of your leg to show that you don't you do in fact have peripheral disease and that if we just fixed it you wouldn't need an amputation uh, then you get an amputation and that doesn't need to happen. Uh, and that's where that 90% comes in. Um, so uh, unfortunately, you know, we could save most people from amputations if we just took a picture and fixed their arteries. Um, but a, a lot of them just don't don't get that picture. Hi, we have a question at uh, Olympic Medical Center for you. Yeah, of course. OK, thanks. Now we're coming through. I, I had a couple questions. Scott Kennedy, thank you very much for this great presentation. 
Um, question about death before discharge, the high mortality, uh, you know, with a BKA and so forth, AKA. Is it cardiovascular death before discharge or is it sepsis or a combination? It, it's a combination. So some of it is they never heal their amputation. Some of it is there's a lot of comorbidity with the amputation and they can't even get to walking or recovering or rehabbing and they end up getting some sort of complicating pneumonia or, you know, whatever. Uh, and then some of it is cardiovascular death because they're such high risk patients with regard to having a surgery in the first place. And most of them have coronary artery disease. Some of them have severe multivessel coronary artery disease. Um, and, you know, one of the things that our practice prides itself on is that, you know, with those kinds of patients, we provide both levels of those care. So instead of being somewhat disjointed in that we fix the coronaries, uh, I run the complex PCI program at Swedish, um, we also will fix your leg arteries. And I think that provides us a unique opportunity where many of these patients are not surgical candidates because they have wounds or infections or things that are going to lead to the amputation. Plus, they're poor surgical candidates with regard to recovery from cardiovascular surgery because of their possible amputation. And so we can help them both cardiovascularly, but also subsequently with their non-healing wounds and, and their peripheral disease. But it, it's a combination of both. And certainly the cardiovascular part is a huge part of the mortality because they just, they have a lot of vascular disease in other vascular beds, whether that's in their carotids and they have a stroke, whether that's in their coronaries and they have a periprocedural heart attack that leads to shock, mm -hmm. things along those lines. But yes, many of them are dying actually from the, the complications of the amputation, infection, sepsis, et cetera. Thank you. That, that makes sense. Another question is uh, the veins. You know, when you, uh, when you do a venous graph down below, how does the how does the vein act on on pathology after death? When you look at that vein, is it does it begin acting like an artery, or is the vein just yeah. a vein forever? No, they strip the so the veins that they use for in situ bypass. Um, they strip the veins of their valves, and then the veins harden quite a bit um, and become a reasonably good conduit. Uh, after that. Now, some of them uh, work and some of them don't. It's not dissimilar to a vein graft in a bypass surgery, which, you know, has about a patency rate of about 50% or so at a year. So the ones that arterialize is the word that we use. Those do well. The ones that don't, they just occlude. And so it's hard to predict which will do which, um, but they do, the ones that arterialize are the ones that work and they do, they become hardened. They, they are not like an artery in the sense that they don't necessarily grow the same degree of media that an artery has. They're not perfect, um, but they're certainly much more like an artery than the, a vein, uh, once they've been arterialized pressure wise. Interesting. Thank you. And then the final question I have is, uh, uh kind of a pre-authorization, uh, or, or just logical step. So uh, needing angiography for, you know, below the knee uh, ischemia symptoms, uh, you know, we've done, a, we've done a duplex, we're going to angiography. Where, where should that be done? Uh, if we do it here, are you going to do it again in order to op operate on what you see in your lab? We are going to do it again uh, at the time of us doing our procedure. If, if you have somebody that does peripheral angiograms there, they can do it. And we could use that information in our planning for when the patient comes. But generally speaking, we can use the duplex to grossly plan what we're going to do and know whether or not we think we're going to need to get pedal access um, or things along those lines. And so normally the duplex is sufficient and we're going to perform an angiogram anyway. Um, but if it's done elsewhere, we do take that information and obviously use it to help plan the procedure itself. Real good. Thank, thanks very much. That's very helpful. Any, uh, any other questions? Hey, I have a, it's completely sort of uh, maybe a little bit off the rails here, but just for your guys' information and you, Dr. Brown, too, you know, uh, you talked about the subset of bringing in infectious disease to help with difficult uh, wounds and osteomyelitis and stuff. Oftentimes those infections are um, um, a problem with uh, antibiotic uh, uh, drug resistance. Um, and this is really a sidebar, but if you guys are bored sometime this weekend, you might look up um, in the uh, federal uh, register, the Pasteur Act. Uh, meaning Pasteur, like uh, Louis Pasteur. Um, there's uh, currently an act that's going through Congress to uh, help create a better funding for research for future novel antibiotics for those 
who uh, who have uh, run out of the usual antibiotics and uh, any uh, effort you can make with your district congressman to help uh, uh, secure passage of the Pasteur Act will help uh, patients with uh, vascular ulcers, osteomyelitis, diabetes, cystic fibrosis, uh, many conditions where antibiotic drug resistance uh, is a real problem in management. Just just a little FYI. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you. Well, look, thanks a million again, folks, for uh, joining us and, and sure hope you have a good holidays and uh, appreciate you being on board, Dr. Brown. We sure love to have you back next year sometime and uh, really, really very helpful uh, overview uh, of this uh, difficult and pretty common problem, huh? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. You guys have a great set of holidays and uh, hopefully the weather treats you well out there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this was excellent. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye-bye.